Broadcasting from Boston, Massachusetts, you're listening to the Technology Equals Equality Podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Technology Equals Equality Podcast. I'm your host, Lori Brooks, and this is episode 66. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Lee Gessmer to the techie community. Lee is an experienced business and intellectual property litigation attorney. He has represented the clients in state and federal courts throughout the United States. His practice focuses on IP and business litigation. One of the skills of which he is proudest is his ability to make complex technology and business issues relatively easy for judges and juries to understand to keep it simple, but not too simple. Lee joins us today for episode 66 to discuss how segmenting helped him scale his practice. Lee, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Lori. Nice to talk to you. Thank you. So what we would love to do is dive into a story of how it is you once saw the future long before you began branding yourself or building out your business, long before you were even working with your dad over the summers. What did you think life would be like? Well, um, when I was a teenager and before I started working for my father, my goal was to become a rock and roll musician because <laughs> I was a guitarist, a guitar player, and a classical piano player as well. In fact, I spent my first two years of college studying classical piano and composition. Uh, so I did. I was in. I had a foot in each in each uh, area of music, both classical and this is the late '60s. So uh, late '60s were rock and roll, the golden era of rock and roll. <laughs> so that's how I saw my future. However, as we all know, uh, only about one in a hundred thousand or one in a million musicians are really successful. Um, and uh, I knew a lot of talented people, and unfortunately, none of them were ever commercially successful. So, um, as you alluded to, I, my father had a business. It was a, uh, a textile business in Haverhill, in an old mill building. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I turned 16, he said to me, you're coming to work for me, starting this summer. <laughs> and I worked for him every summer through my first year of law school. Back in those days, you, um, you didn't do a clerkship after the first year of law school. You hung out. <laughs> so he, so I would drive from Newton, Massachusetts to Haverhill, Massachusetts with him wow. every day for years, for summers, vacations, every vacation, every summer. Um, and, uh, you know, he would tell me, you know, he was an entrepreneur. They didn't call it that then. They called himself a businessman. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me, you know, to, to be successful in the United States, you need to start your own business. Mm-hmm. Um, so those seeds were planted very, very early for me. It tends to make an impact as kids are growing up watching their parents or understanding from their parents' experiences that owning your own business is one of those pieces of the American way of life that really attributes to your ability to achieve success. So, well, it's not as, it's not as frightening because you see it done exactly. in your own family. Right. Um, if, you, if you don't grow up in a family like that, you have no role models you never see it done, and you probably set up imaginary obstacles right. to doing this right. um, that, that don't exist for people whose families are in the business world. No, definitely. I think the ability to have easy and regular access to that sort of wisdom is something that makes a, a huge difference in someone's interest or ability to move forward. What do you feel like were some of the first steps that you took? You recognized, okay, I'm going to law school, but I'd like to start my own practice. What do you feel were some of the first steps that you took to begin building out your practice once you had had your degree, had the experience in the field? Well, I, I guess I have to have to quote Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins on this. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm actually a fan of his, been to a couple of his, his um programs mm-hmm. and he, he's a very smart guy and he he says you should always be making distinctions as you look around you make distinctions observe what's happening and consciously make distinctions between successful and successful strategies uh different parts of the market in this case and uh, i think that from from the day i graduated from law school i my father had implanted in me the desire to start my own law firm so i was looking around 
um, and I went to a big law firm, we call it Big Law nowadays, in Washington, D.C. It's a huge multi-hundred lawyer antitrust firm, and I realized that there, first of all, I got homesick for Boston because I grew up here, mm -hmm. um, and secondly, I realized that, that that was not the environment to learn how to start a firm. Moved back to Boston uh, after a couple of years and went to work for a fairly large firm in Boston called Choate Hall & Stewart, a fantastic firm, um, and there, the clients were a lot smaller, had a lot more client contact, got to spend a lot more time in court, and got more hands-on experience. You can't, can't hang your own shingle or start your own firm straight out of law school or after spending three or four years in the library doing legal research right. in a law firm. You have to have hands-on experience. Right. So I was always looking for that, um, you know, from, from day one. Um, and it took, it took five or six or seven years to kind of get my feet on the ground and see, keep continuously looking for an opportunity to see an opportunity in what back in that, in that era we called computer law, but today we call more broadly intellectual property law. When you were looking for the opportunity, you're indicating that it was in intellectual property law, but was that one of the first steps that you, you were taking once you had gained the experience, once you had actually worked in a couple of different firms, you moved away, you came back to Boston. What were the first steps that you were taking, or was that the first step that you took, was looking for an opportunity in computer law? And if so, what was it that made you look for the opportunity in the computer law field? Well, and what made me look for the opportunity was, first of all, uh, I'm a voracious reader. <laughs> And like, you know, Warren Buffett says, you know, Charlie Munger, his partner, said two guys in the 80s, they say that, you know, you've got to be a voracious reader your entire life. You've got to be constantly soaking up information. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a voracious reader and always have been. Um, and then, you know, you've got to have a huge kind of database of knowledge in your brain that you can then use creatively to look for opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading about what then was the microcomputer revolution. We had a case at Chilton Hall and Stewart involving software arts, the mm. founders of which were Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston, the two guys that literally invented the spreadsheet that first powered the Apple computer and then the IBM PC and kind of jump-started the entire business com computer revolution in the early 80s. So I had all these things going on. At the same time, you got to get out and kind of mingle with the, with the outside world. You can't just sit in your closet and think about this stuff. So I, um, I joined the Boston Computer Society, which was a hugely influential and important organization at the time. In fact, when Steve Jobs introduced the Macintosh computer, he did a dual bi-coastal release, a bi-coastal Jobs on stage show, first uh, in California, and then he flew to Boston and did the same routine on stage in Boston before the Boston Computer Society membership. Um, so I was at that, you know. So I'm, I'm meeting all these people in the Boston Computer Society. I see there's an enormous amount of creative ferment going on mm -hmm. in Boston. And um, I joined the Boston Computer Society, and as it turned out, there was a legal, a legal section or a legal subgroup, and I joined that started meeting people, some of whom I still know to this day, many of whom I still know to this day. And I met a lawyer who was at, who had just left Bull Baranek and Newman. His name is Rick, Rick Lukash, Richard Lukash. Uh, Bull Baranek and Newman is one of the companies where the internet truly was invented. Um, he was a, an MIT physics graduate um, and law and lawyer. And, uh, you know, I approached him and said, Rick, you know, you, know, you just left Bull Baranek and Newman. You're a sole practitioner. I'm at this big law firm. Let's start a law firm that practices, quote unquote, computer law. Uh, it sounds archaic to say that today, but that's what we called it then. And uh, after much persuasion, arm twisting, and alcohol, I, I, uh, I persuaded him, and um, we we went we went forward. You know, two of the two of us. You know, in a tiny rented office, um, 31 years ago. I love that. Um, those are some of the steps. <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly what I was looking for. Because I understand that you were scoping out opportunity, but that can look very different in, in many different fields and across entrepreneurial journeys, even if it is in the same field. So I was curious as to what that looked like for you. And I like how you explained that you joined a relevant society in the area subgroup of the Boston Computer Society that was allowing you to have the opportunity to network 
and recognize the opportunity in the industry, but also to network and meet Richard Lukash and, and begin the actual um, practice yeah. itself. Yeah. So, yeah. no, that's... Yeah. At that time, there were probably 10,000 lawyers in Massachusetts. Today, there's a lot more than that. I'm, I'm guesstimating there were 10,000 then. And t only 20 or 30 out of those 10,000 self-selected to go to those meetings and meet each other. Right. Yeah. right. That's right. a tiny, tiny number. Very much so. And even today, I'm sure, you know, the numbers are rather low when it comes to the amount of entrepreneurs that actually make it to networking events. What do you feel, you know, once you actually started your practice and decided, okay, we are growing our firm in what was then computer law, what do you feel were some of the first steps in creating the revenue model for your practice? Well, Rick and I realized, Rick was had expertise in, in licensing, um, uh, licensing law and, and technology law. I had expertise in litigation, but we didn't have uh, anyone between the two of us, we didn't have any skills in mergers and acquisitions. And even then we realized that high technology companies needed to get funded. They needed to do their A rounds, their B rounds, their C rounds, and they needed to get sold or to buy other companies. Start up, sell out, repeat is, is, is the mantra of many of our clients over the years. So we started looking for a, a third lawyer to fill that gap and we found we we're extraordinarily lucky. We found a brilliant lawyer, Andy Updegrove, who was at a firm called Tester Hurwitz and Tebow, which was a huge, uh, at the time it wasn't that large, but became a huge IT powerhouse law firm in Boston. And we were lucky enough to persuade Andy to uh, leave Tester Hurwitz and to join us, which was a, a tr tr tremendous leap of faith on his part. And uh, he became really critical to our success and has been to this day uh, extraordinarily important to the firm's success. He's a brilliant lawyer, incredibly productive, and for many, many years, he ran our mergers and acquisition, uh, the M&A side of the firm, and gave us that essential capability. Um, he also, I just have to say as an aside, uh, at some point he uh, had an opportunity to represent a standard setting organization and has since, since then, developed uh, a, a, an enormous practice, one of the largest in the country, representing standard-setting organizations, sometimes called consortia, but better called standard-setting organizations. We've represented uh, probably 100 at any given time. We probably represent 40 or 50 or 60, and he's generally traveling all over the world, uh, attending their board meetings and representing them. So he's developed an, an extraordinary expertise in that area. Uh, so I uh, just have to mention that, uh, you know, have to, have to, you know, pay, pay dues where mm. the dues are, 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 are really uh, uh, most, most justified. Um, so, so now, re remind me of your question, because I, <laughs> I, I think I went off it there. No, it's quite all right. What I was saying was, what were the, some of the first steps you took in creating the revenue model for the firm? But I love what you did explain was how it is you looked at scaling the practice, which was really, you know, segmenting out the areas of expertise that you had in the practice and understanding the need that you had in your own firm to fill for the clients that you had. Um, so again, you know, looking at the need for the market that you were already working with and understanding where that expansion line could come from and then filling that spot accordingly versus just kind of hiring on other, uh, you know, uh, lawyers over the years just to grow the practice with other lawyers. It was, you know, a very strategic model okay. that you created okay. in order to grow that. All right. so. now, now, now let me address the revenue model a little bit more directly. Certainly. Um, we, we realized back in 1986, 88, 1990, that there were a ton of small companies that really could not and should not try to afford the large firm fees. I mean, the large firms, the large law firms, are really suited to represent large companies mm -hmm. um, that are not fee sensitive. But if you're a startup, you've got a limited pile of capital, and the last thing you want to do is spend it on overpriced lawyers. So we, we, our, our, our concept was, first of all, have lower overhead. You know, you go into these large law firms, and their reception areas are larger than the most living spaces of people on this planet. You, know, you have to wonder who's paying for all the square footage, you know, in the 30th floor of this building, mm -hmm. you know, 
where they've got, you know, uh, 4,000 square feet of reception area, um, you know, and views of the harbor. You know, our clients don't care about that. Right. If they do, they shouldn't be our clients. So we've always kept our overhead low. We've always kept our fees low. Uh, and we've, we've always explained to clients, you know, you're getting the same services from me that you would get from me if I were Charles Hall Stewart, that you would get from Rick Lucas if he was at Oak Brandon and Newman, or before that at Ropes and Gray, uh, if, if, that you would get from uh, from uh, um, uh, Andy Updegrove if he were Tester Hurwitz at Tebow or Bingham, Dana, and Gould. You know, you're getting exactly the same thing from us at probably uh, uh, between a, a one-third and one-half lower hourly rate. So we've always been really sensitive to our clients' economic needs, which a lot of big law firms Big firm lawyers are not. They aren't trained to. They aren't really inculcated in that idea that you've got to you can't charge your clients a small fortune. You've got to charge them what's reasonable for their size and their needs and their abilities. So that's always been our our our, our concept to this day. Um, I remember when I was at Hall and Stewart or at other firms, um, you go to a meeting and there'd be five lawyers sitting around the table and there'd be the client. And uh, you could see the, the gears turning in the client's head. Let's see, five lawyers, let's see, at $300 an hour back then, let's see, three times 500, that's $1,500 an hour. So I'm sitting here paying $1,500 an hour for this room full of lawyers, four of whom are not talking mm-hmm. to me. They're just sitting there, you know, taking notes. You know, so, you know, we had a rule from day one, no more than two lawyers in a room or on a conference call. Um, you know, it just is abusive to clients to do that. We don't do that. You know, so we had all these little rules, these little practice tips that we tried to, to, to institute that would allow clients to work with us on better economic terms. Right. It- Sounds like you created a penetration strategy for the market that was conducive to the budget for the clients that you wanted to be working with in the first place. By keeping the low overhead, the fees could be lower. Implementing a couple of tricks of the trade that you understood, there was overhead and costs of additional lawyers that were just unnecessary. By keeping it to core services and and necessities, you're capable of keeping those costs much lower for, for the clientele that you're looking for. So exactly. do you feel that that was part of the key to the success of your firm or do you feel it was your team or what do you feel was responsible for the, what was the key to your success? The, the only way to build a law firm or build a law practice is to have happy clients <laughs> because the entire economy of law, law of, of legal services, at least in this part of the country, is built on referrals right. from clients. You know, we don't tell our clients, go out and tell other people that we're good lawyers. You know, we just know that they're, they get asked, you know, right. who, who, who represented you when you started your company? Uh, who represented you in this case? Who represented you when you got sued by the employee or when you had tax issues? And eventually, you know, you build, it takes a long time, as in decades. Um, but eventually, you know, that slowly builds like a, like a, like a, like a, an avalanche, you know, a very slow moving avalanche. And eventually you, people, you, people realize that, you know, if you get referred to us by someone that we represented well, you come to us with a, with a, a high degree of confidence. And that's, that's how lawyers develop their practices. That's the only way they can do it. I mean, there's, of course, there's advertising on the back of bus, of bus, bus, <laughs> bus benches, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, but we're not like, you know, we're not in the better call Saul type of law business. <laughs> Funny. <Funnily. laughs> so we don't do that. You know? No, I love it. Solid customer service, you know, happy customers definitely make a business move forward. Uh, without them, you're you're kind of not in business. <laughs> yeah, we don't want any client to be to be unhappy. You know, and, and I've said to clients many times over the years, when if a client gets a bill, first of all, I never want to surprise a client with a bill, mm-hmm. which which the big firms tend to do. I want the client to ask me what's this going to cost, and tell them, and I tell them if it's going to cost more than that, I'll tell you so that you know beforehand. Number one, and number two, if a client does get a bill that they're not happy with, and they call me up and tell me that, I say to them, tell me, tell me, what, just pay us what you think is fair. Period. The ball is totally in your court. And number one, ninety-eight percent of the time, the client will discount the bill by five or ten percent. 
mm-hmm. which is a small a small amount. And if it's much more than that, we'll just say to the client, "Look, this is obviously not a good. It's not a good. Uh, it's not a good relationship. Right. Um, you know, for whatever reason, you know, pay us what you think is fair on this bill, and uh, you know, and and maybe you should, you know, we'll try to help you find some other lawyer to work with you mm-hmm. that you can work with more efficiently. Mm-hmm. But that happens incredibly rarely. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just kind of you know our plan B is you know it's to, to, to tell a client that if I, if I it's been years since I've had to say that to a client. Right. Right. I can't imagine that 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 would be a regular thing that you would have to do. It sounds as though no, you guys no, really care incredible, about incredibly what you're rare. doing. Exactly. It sounds yeah. like you guys care, and and that in and of itself creates a service level that you know can far exceed other firms that are out there. Um, Lee, do you have a, a tip or a trick or even a favorite application of some sort that you feel has really helped you through the years in your practice that may be helpful to the audience? Well, as you can imagine, the, the, at least the founding attorneys at this firm, the lawyers that were, came in are, are early, are, 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 were technology nuts. <laughs> um, and we've always used technology, at least you know, going back to the beginning of the firm, we used technology vastly more than other lawyers. And we've devised our own, uh, you know, using Lotus Notes, which is as a, as a programming mm-hmm. capacity built into it. We've built our own conflict check system, our own, um, you know, our, we've built a lot of, a lot of, we've devised, developed a lot of software in the firm, within the firm, to help run the firm internally. Yes. Um, but um, my, my personal tip trick or favorite <laughs> application is Evernote. Which, yeah. uh, which, full disclosure, is a client of ours. Um, um, but um, uh, I, I think I started using it before they even became a client. I'm not sure what the order of order of events was there. But um, a number of us, uh, several of us, really uh, use Evernote very intensively. I save everything there. Awesome. Um, so that's my fav- That's my favorite application. Um, a favorite tip is, I mean, I love listening to podcasts. Um, including business podcasts, and I really enjoy listening to Tim Ferriss. Yes. You know, his podcasts, his business podcasts, and the people he interviews, uh, I really find often to be very inspirational. So those are a couple of things that I do. I absolutely love Tim Ferriss and um, enjoy listening to podcasts, and I will be sure to link to both Tim Ferriss as well as Evernote through the show notes page. But Lee, if we had a time machine and we could go back 30, 40 years, and you could tell yourself just one thing, what would it be? Well, first, that's a really difficult question, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let me just say that. So I'm, I'm, I'm really challenged by that question. And I, I, I don't have what I would consider to be a really fantastic answer. Or the, and by that, I mean an answer that makes me really happy. Um, so with that disclaimer, um, I, I, I really enjoy, I found, I, I, I've known that, I, I've always known that I would enjoy teaching. And right now, I've, last year and this year, I've been teaching an online course through Harvard Law School called Copyright X. Um, you can check it out at copyrightx.org. Um, and it's a, you know, I go to meetings uh, over at Harvard Law School with a professor. We talk about, with a number of teaching fellows, we talk about a strategy. And then it's an hour and a half class um, online once a week with students all over the world. And I love doing that. And uh, I've always known that I would, would enjoy that kind of thing. And I, if I could go back, I would have tried to um, uh, find opportunities to teach in the, uh, in the Boston area uh, law school community um, uh, earlier than, than, than now. Uh, I've tried to do it the last year or two, um, and I found it difficult. The schools are under budget constraints, um, which even though you know I don't want to get paid for this, seems to reduce the number of classes, it's reduced the number of students. They're under a lot of stress from what I can see. Mm-hmm. And it's much harder for me now to find those opportunities, which I'm, I have more time for now, and I'm more interested in pursuing but which are more difficult to accomplish. So, so I'm not fully, totally satisfied with my answer to you, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's the best I can do under the circumstances. That's a lovely um, answer, Lee. Yeah. That's actually, you know, one of the resounding answers that we receive. Start sooner. Start sooner. You know, most entrepreneurs would go back and tell themselves to 
not wait as long, not allow themselves to be as uh, hesitant to begin the journey, even if it is just a portion of the journey that you're referencing, start sooner. So, no, that's wonderful. The show is really designed to help entrepreneurs uh, come up with ideas to solve the pain in an industry that they may not have really been thinking of. And, Lee, you were one of the very first lawyers we've had on the show. So we are curious. If you could change, you know, if we could lend you this magic wand that we have and you could change anything at all in your business, what would it be and why? I'm, I'm really challenged by that question as well because <laughs> I really feel that we've, we've, done, we've done everything right. I mean, the, when, when, when we started the firm 30, 31 years ago, one of our goals was to ensure the firm's continuity and develop a second generation of managers in the firm, which we've done successfully. Um, and now we're trying to develop the third generation of managers because people will not join the firm. The firm can't grow and, and, and prosper unless people know it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's not going to shut its doors when its founders turn 65 or 70 years old, which mm -hmm. happens to a lot of law firms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of smaller firms uh, mid-sized firms do that. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, we've, we've always encouraged all of our lawyers to, you know, to, to do quote-unquote marketing, which I don't like using that word, but at least it has meaning to people, you know, which means, you know, to do writing, to do uh, blogging, to go to organizations like the equivalent of the Boston Computer Society today, um, you know, to, to uh, develop the same attitude toward clients that we had originally to keep the firm's, you know, kind of mission um, in mind. Uh, we've, I think we've, I think we've really, really done it right. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm not being arrogant or egotistical when I say I'm, I really have a hard time thinking of anything we would change. But again, <laughs> Lee, that's, that's a good thing because you're a lawyer who has expertise in funding mergers, acquisitions, and selling businesses. So the fact that you created an amazing scalable practice that also has a succession plan built in, it's beautiful. <laughs> so congrats. I, I yeah, think I mean, that's people get asked in interviews, you know, what's your, weak, what's your weakness? You know, and some people say, I don't have any weaknesses. Right. You know, right. so your question, your question is like, you know, you know, what would you have done differently? That's like, what's your, what's your weakness? I don't have any weaknesses. Well, I don't, wouldn't have done anything differently. Well, that's, you know, that's really my truthful answer. I just uh, I'm, I'm have a hard time thinking about what we, should, what we, would have, what we could have done differently what you going back changed. 15, 20, 25 years. Right, right. No, it sounds like you have it covered and, and you, like I said, have the structure created in such a manner that sleepless nights are a thing of the past. So, again, congrats. Lee, what is the best way for our listeners to find you? Just through our website, all of our lawyers, including myself, of course, our, our, our profiles, our email addresses are all there. It's very simple. It's my name, G-E-S-M-E-R, Gessmer.com. I will be sure to link to Gessmer.com through the show notes page. But, Lee, you've been absolutely lovely, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Disputes are inevitable, but Lee has over 35 years of experience helping clients resolve them in a way that makes the most business sense. If you need legal assistance in your practice, reach out to Lee at Gessmer.com. Thank you again, Lee, for joining us. We truly appreciate you sharing your time and expertise with the audience. And techie community, thank you for hanging out here with us for episode 66. And until our next episode, when we continue to hear the journey, find the pain, and create solutions, enjoy the week. 